and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest author is someone named Stephen K. Ray. We know him as Steve Ray, who, along with Dennis K. Walters, wrote the book The Papacy, What the Pope Does and Why It Matters, published by our good friends at Ignatius Press, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Always great to see you, Steve. Thank you, Doug. Good it's been to a be while here, yeah. since we've seen each other this in person. This is the fourth book I think I've done with you. Right. Going back to, I thought it was interesting, too, because remembering, um, obviously, you were back in the summer on with Father Mitch talking about this particular topic, but it reminded me, I'm saying, I was thinking to myself, what was the f one of the first books? And it was Upon This Rock. Yep. And there, again, having to do with the Pope. Yep. So when you decided to do this book on the papacy did you draw on any of that material from some of your earlier books very briefly because that book is much more I'd say scholarly with lots of footnotes and documentation going back and digging into scripture in the first eight mm -hmm. centuries of the fathers of the church documenting that the papacy had a continuity all the way from the old to the New Testament all the way into the early church this one what we wanted to do Dennis and I were to was to um, put together a book that was much simpler mm -hmm. of a read um, that anybody can pick up. It's kind of the A to Z of the papacy. So we drew on the other book for the history and the scripture part of it, but this has a lot of different right. things in it, bringing it a uh, much more right. complete picture. And you talk about what the Pope does and why it matters. Is some of that impacted today because of the fact with social media, we know every, like, every hour what the Pope is basically thinking or doing, et cetera, when in the past that wasn't the case. And so to some degree, people are inundated with material and to some degree, people need to understand, well, what is important and what's not important? What Are there things, I, I respect the Pope, but the, everything he says, something I have to pay exact attention to, what do I have to pay attention to? Right, earlier on, all you had to do is a Pope would make an official statement or a definition, and that's pretty much all you heard from him because mm -hmm. he didn't have the, the social media and television and everything. But so really, with John Paul II, he was a world traveler, and he, every, all the media loved him, too. He was so um, good on media mm -hmm. that we started to see the Pope a lot more and think about it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And see, I'm a convert. I was a Baptist. I didn't like the Pope. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that was a big issue for me, to becoming a Catholic. I was sola scriptura, the Bible alone, but it was... The, I realized that couldn't work. Mm -hmm. My journey began not with seeing anything good about the Catholic Church. It began when I realized the problems in Protestantism mm -hmm. with the Bible alone. And then I had to deal with the issue of authority. Mm -hmm. And this is where that came in, the papacy. Right. I realized there had to be the papacy and the tradition right. and the scriptures. A three-legged stool, so to speak, right. and it needed three legs to right. stand. So, but with the current um, decades of the Pope being in the front all the time, being right. quoted and talked to, and especially with Pope Francis, you know, he's very accessible. Mm -hmm. We thought it would be a good idea to have a book to help people understand, because there's so many misconceptions. Right, exactly. Now, you open it up with the papacy, and you're walking along the narrow streets of Jerusalem, and then you talk about uh, the Holy Spirit. and you, Why did you have these three different scenarios you set up right in the beginning? Well, partly because I came from some, from two of those scenarios without the authority. But what we did is we we tried to open the book as why it was necessary. And we assumed, okay, the first day Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, the wind blows through Jerusalem. You all hear it. You go hear Peter preach. Then you have three different scenarios. What if all the apostles and everybody just said, wow, that's wonderful. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to meditate on this and I'm going to pray and I'm just going to be very devout. But nothing developed more than that it would have faded away probably mm -hmm. in a generation second scenario is each of the apostles goes out and starts their own kind of like lone rangers mm -hmm. they go out and start their own thing mm -hmm. they start this denomination or that denomination and pretty soon the next generation they're fighting and infighting with each other and there's no central source of authority the third which is what we have is that the church is actually a government it's not just a, the body of christ which it is it's mm -hmm. a lot of things but it's also it is a government it's, it's like a civic authority as well and it has a leadership and it has the papacy the bishop of rome and then you keep the unity it's the organic unity of the whole thing it's like a sheep I've learned this from Israel a lot. Mm -hmm. Sheep are pretty dumb animals. Mm -hmm. And if the shepherd isn't there watching them, they'll go off in every direction, right. Right, go right up and sniff a wolf, you know, and get eaten. Right. That's why the shepherd has the staff to keep the flock with sheep's leaving. He pulls him back with that hook. That's why we had to have right. this, this. Well, let me ask you a question. You're a scholar on these things, and you always hear this about, well, the one lost sheep leaves the 99 and goes looking for the one. And I'm thinking, did he close the sheep gate? Did he leave his dog there across the sheep gate? I mean, I can't believe he just left it open for because while he's looking for them, the others might wander yeah, away. Yeah. So 
What's the meaning there? I, I think it's Jesus used rabbinic hyperbole. He would okay. use exaggerated situations okay. in order to make a point. He was wanting to explain how special you are and how special I am and the listeners, that he's willing to not to neglect the other 99, mm -hmm. but he's so concerned about us, he's willing to take every risk to get us back. And that's what the shepherd does. The shepherd is to keep the flock together. And what happened, for example, in the Protestant uh, Reformation, which I call a deformation now, is that groups of sheep decided they were not going to listen to the shepherd anymore, and that's why there's such confusion. That's right. why there's so many denominations, and every everybody's sort of supposedly reading the same Bible, and the same right. Holy Spirit's interpreting it for them, but I had to conclude maybe the Holy Spirit's right. very confused. Right. Well, it's but interesting, I, too, because for, for people like yourself or somebody who would be in that one of those denominations saying, well, I don't like the idea of the Pope, Maybe the problem is because each pastor is their own pope. Exactly, and it, it even goes lower than that. Mm. Each per, each Protestant is their own pope. I realized at a certain point that when Martin Luther threw away one pope, he created a billion new popes. Right. And I was Pope Steve, and my wife was Popus Janet. Right. And I realized that that doesn't work. And Martin Luther thought he was pope, he and does. he wasn't uh, very interested in what the peasants had to we say. We don't in Germany. need popes nor councils. I am my own pope and council, says right. Martin Luther. Right. But Luther had spoken, so you. Still supposed to listen to him. Uh, in a divine pattern of leadership, you make this point. Nowhere do you find a scriptural accounts of Christian loners, solitary believers wandering off on their own, rugged individuals privately hugging their new faith while rejecting church authority. There was no just Jesus and me believers. Exactly. That's what I had to come to grips with as an evangelical. I'm a very independent kind of a guy. I loved being in charge of my own theology and my own spiritual views. I did not like, and by the way, Doug, I used to say to people, Catholics, why do you let some old man in Rome tell you what to do? I just can't understand why we're in America, the land of individualism and the Bible. Why do you let some old man in Rome tell you what to do? It took me some humbling and uh, learning some humility that I couldn't be my own pope. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even have the Bible put together for the first four centuries. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the end of the fourth century that the early Christians wow. had a Bible they could carry under their arm to church. It was, for oh, the way I say this when, when I take my groups to the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. when Jesus went up into the clouds, he did not turn around and, and yell back, oh, and don't forget to read my book, guys. That's right. There was no book. Right. What did Jesus leave behind? He left behind 12 men, a right. motley crew, one of them carrying and the And in the New Testament, when they talk about Scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. They certainly are. Right, but they a didn't. lot of people today interpreted it that as if they were talking about the New Testament. Yeah, they the didn't time. have a New Testament. It right. wasn't written for the end of the first century. They didn't have the documents all written, and then it took another two centuries or more before it was collected into a book. Well, let's talk about the papacy, and you go through it, and you kind of talk about the Pope's... Uh, normal duties, et cetera. But one of the big things, and I, I think it was a bugaboo, even inside the church um, over 150 years ago, and certainly for the idea of infallibility. Now, and you talk about Vatican Council I. That's where this was officially proclaimed. But was that when it was first understood? This is one of the misconceptions that people have, is that one day at Vatican I, they invented papal infallibility. Mm -hmm. And in 1950, they invented the assumption of Mary into heaven. That's not the case at all. This was, going back to the issue of the papacy and the primacy of Rome, this was understood in the very beginning, and we deal with that in one section in this book, and mm -hmm. I deal with it all a lot more in, uh, in detail in my book, Upon This Rock. But from the very first century, you see the apostolic fathers who, without a Bible in their hand yet mm -hmm. in the New Testament, who knew Peter and Paul and still had the words of the apostles ringing in their ears, they say, they were bishops of Rome and they recognized it. Clement, for example, first century, writes mm. to a church over a thousand miles away, Corinth. They appealed to him for answers, recognizing his authority. Mm. He responds back, now that I've told you what to do as the bishop of Rome and so on, if you don't obey us, meaning the council of bishops and the Holy Spirit, mm. you will be in no small sin. That is a very strong statement of infallibility. We're mm. telling you something and it's the Holy Spirit and us, you must obey or you're no small sin. Ignatius of Antioch as well writes, and he writes to churches, but when he writes to Rome, it's very different. He says, you are the teacher of the world. Mm -hmm. This was first century, guys. Right, clearly as you indicate that, 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 that there was a level of authority that clearly right. was respected. Right. Okay, so, and, and I guess the other thing with the infallibility is when we talk about it, what does it have to do with? It's not everything the Pope decides to say on any given day right. is suddenly infallible. 
This is one of the misconceptions I had and one of the reasons we wanted to write the book to clear mm -hmm. these up. I thought when Catholics said that the Pope is infallible, it meant that he's impeccable, meaning without sin, or that everything he says and does now is infallible or you have, to. but the Pope is not in a position to, to predict the football scores next week or what the weather's going to be a month from now. And he's not in his private correspondence and his talking with reporters, with his daily life. He's not infallible in mm -hmm. those ways. Infallibility is very carefully defined by the church. It has only to do with faith and morals, not with all these other things, but faith and morals. It has to do, he is intending as the pastor of the universal church do, to be defining doctrine. He has to do it of his own free will without a gun to his head. And he has to uh, intentionally um, explain and define something and let us know that that's what he's doing. Only then is infallibility mm -hmm. really, there's levels of authority. He can right. speak to people on a, day, on a daily basis. He can write encyclicals. He can make pronouncements and give a bull, so uh, that's right. the official statement. But the highest one is the extraordinary a magisterium is when right. he defines something they call it, from the chair of Peter, right, right. intentionally deciding to do that, which happens rarely. Rarely, right. But there's something called the ordinary magisterium. There is. And we are too, in that case also, it's, it's like, well, he didn't pronounce it from the chair, so I don't have to listen to him. Right. Well, that was the rap against humane vitae. Exactly. You know, saying, exactly. well, he didn't make it as Catholic, so I don't have to right. pay any attention to it. And, and we have to be careful with that. It's, it's interesting, uh, an old uh, priest friend of mine from years ago said, you have to be careful about popolatry. He said, you know, you might have, and this is John Paul II, well, you have somebody like John Paul II who you think is terrific, but you may end up down the road with a pope who has a different perspective or who isn't, and you have to still respect him, but right. you have to respect both of them in an understanding of what their role and function actually is. Right. It's just like in the army, you respect the general, whether you like the general or not as a person. Right. You still reject, you still um, ex respect that office. Jesus made an office. He gave the keys. He's the king of the empire, uh, the king of the kingdom, and he gives his keys to the royal steward. And that's how we explain this. It's all based on the Old Testament, actually. Gives the keys to the royal steward, and that royal steward is now in charge. Mm -hmm. Whether we like the royal steward or not, or the way he dresses or talks or whatever, right. isn't the issue. That is an office Jesus established, and we have respect for the office. Well, what do you say, people would say, they say whether it be, they, did, they liked Benedict, they didn't like Benedict, they might like France, they don't like France. People say, well, the Holy Spirit picked him. There, there's a question as to whether the Holy Spirit picks, personally picks the Pope or not. Well, but how could the Holy Spirit pick somebody? Otherwise, you would be denying the free will of the cardinals exactly. to vote who, for who they felt That's called exactly to vote right. for, right? And they have set up a system where the Holy Spirit uses the men, just like he did in writing Scripture. The Holy Spirit didn't sit down with a pen and paper and write Scripture. He used men and used their personalities and their right. weaknesses and strengths. And he does the same with the election of a pope. He uses the cardinals to, to gather together. They elect, make the best choice they can, and we trust the Lord right. to, to oversee it. Right, to, exactly. Uh, superintend it. You know, you talk about in this book, we'll look at the papacy from different angles. Chapters 2 and 3 examine the pope's role as leader and teacher of the truth. Chapter 4 tells the stories of several men who became great popes. Chapter 5 describes how a pope is selected, how the election process developed. How did it develop? How did it used to be in the early days? When Peter, obviously, he's the first pope, Jesus just appointed him, gave him the keys. And then you realize that a royal steward, when he dies, he doesn't throw the keys away. They are succeeded. They're handing on to another. It seems like in the first century, Peter assigned or chose his successor. And probably that's the way it went through mm -hmm. the first century. Towards the second, when we get into the next century, it was more by the different bishops getting together and, and, and they would decide among some and then they would narrow it down and then mm -hmm. they would give even the people a place to where they could all, you know, hey, hey, you know, they'd all shout right, yes. Right. Uh, whatever got the loudest shouts would be the Pope. Um, to, but what happened then is that uh, strong, when Christianity became legalized, mm -hmm. the church was legal, there became very influential families and mm -hmm. empires, and they tried to get involved in the appointing and the uh, manipulating the game. So well, you speak. even talk about the, the, the old European veto, right? I mean, you talk about one of the elections where a veto was yes. placed by uh, uh, one of the uh, 
of uh, the Hungarian, it was the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian yes. Empire or something That's where they like kept that. getting involved, their families and the governments and, and manipulating. In Simony, they'd buy offices and so on. So then around, after about around 1,000, they changed it to where just the bishops were mm -hmm. choosing it now. And now after the 15, 1600s, after the Protestant Reformation and so on, now it's, it's much, it's done within the cardinals. And even there, sometimes it took a long time to choose a pope. They, they, the longest was three years and they mm -hmm. still hadn't elected one, so right. that's the conclave means the keys. Is that when they locked them up and told them, that's it, boys, you got to make a decision here? Here's some bread and water, <laughs> and as soon as you get the decision, right. we'll bring in the stake. <laughs> and you're locked in here till you... And the Holy Spirit got right. to work. Right. The Holy Spirit. Uh, and now the, 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 the choices come much quicker. Right. Now, you also say, make the point that the Pope is not for Catholics only, and you have a chapter talking about that. What does that mean? Well, we think of the Pope just as the head of the church, which he is, but as the head of the church, he also is our main representative, and therefore, as a bishop, he is a teacher, and we see when Jesus appointed Peter, he made him both, he said, tend my lambs, which means to govern, and feed, which means to teach, but he also then is to be a fisher of men. He's supposed to go out and relate to the world around him. So the Pope is responsible not just for inwardly teaching and governing us with the bishops, but also to represent us to the world. So how does the Catholic Church relate to Islam? How does it relate to Judaism? How does it relate to Buddhism in the secular world? And so the Pope is, and this really has been even more so in the last decades with John Paul II because he went out of his way to relate to all these others. Right. And so as a family, we're always trying to the Papa goes out and represents the family, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so he is a the representative of the church to the world, trying to relate to all the other groups and to represent us well, and hopefully to have everybody become Catholic. Now, the, the Pope, you were talking about the hierarchy, and, and, but yet the Pope is a servant. How is he a leader and a servant at the same time? Well, what, um, Jesus made the point that the kings and they, they dominate and they rule over you. You are to be the servant of all. And I think it was a great title, the servant of the servants of God, because that's really the Pope is there to serve. A shepherd isn't the boss. A shepherd is there to take care of the sheep. He serves the sheep. He stays up at night to fight the wolves off. So in a sense, he is the head of the church. Mm -hmm. But in Christianity, we understand headship or leadership as more a role of servant, where it's like I'm the father of my family, and my job is not to boss my kids around. My job is to make sure they have food, to discipline them, to love them, to make sure they grow up to be solid human beings. And I think that's what bishops and the Pope's job as well. You say here, authoritative papal teaching is principally concerned with faith and morals. It can also touch on certain other matters needed to safeguard or, or elaborate points of faith and morals. It's based on the Word of God as contained in Scripture and tradition and in God's self-disclosure throughout the created world. The Pope and the bishops have the responsibility to preserve the deposit of faith. And what that means is that the apostles, Jesus and the apostles, left a deposit of faith, and you cannot add to that or subtract from it. And the bishop and bishops and the Pope, their job is to preserve that, to teach it and explain it and disseminate it to the people. I, I describe it in my movie on Mary mm -hmm. as a cabbage, and you peel back the layers of the cabbage, you get deeper and deeper, you understand more and more. It's not a new cabbage, it's not a new doctrine or theology, it's all contained in that deposit of faith. And the bishop and the pope, uh, they are to, to preserve that and teach it in the, in, the, uh, in the church so that we have the full deposit of faith. But they're not, they can't change it, mm -hmm. they can't delete from it or subtract from it. They have to teach it faithfully. And, and every pope is more or less able to do that. Some are great teachers, mm -hmm. some are great administrators, but overall you look at 2,000 years of what we have as a pope in the unity of the church, it's quite remarkable. All right. You talked about infallibility, and we did. You say it's often confused with inspiration. Yes, um, what that would mean. Inspiration means spire means breath. The scripture is inspired by God. That means that God breathed it. He's the primary author of scripture. But the words of the Pope and the Church are not inspired in that way. Only mm -hmm. scripture is. They can be. Um, inspired in a way that they're led by the Holy Spirit, but they're, they're, they are not inspired the way Scripture is. They have to take the inspired Scripture. They have to take the tradition that we have, those two sources of revelation, Scripture and tradition, and their job 
is to understand it and to teach it and to interpret it for us. Now, I can read the Bible. You can read the Bible. We can apply it to our own lives. Mm -hmm. But the official teacher of the scriptures and of the tradition is the Pope and the Magisterium of the In the chapter 5 selection of the Pope, most people think a new Pope is a successor of the Pope he replaces. Therefore, Francis is a successor of Benedict XVI to a successor of John Paul II. But that's not all there is to it. The Pope is not just a successor of the previous Pope. He's the successor of Peter, Peter the Apostle. Why is that important for us to remember? Because Peter was the one Jesus chose. And, for example, Pope Francis does not um, follow he does follow but he's not the successor of Benedict it's important because Jesus made these promises to Peter and that authority carries on and, and I still see it in this sense that Peter's still in heaven and he is still very much intercessing and in charge of the church in fact uh, when Pope Leo when there was a council um, they uh, won't get all the details of it there was a council and when they read his tome it was called Seventeen times the bishop stood up in acclamation and said, Peter has spoken through Leo. Mm. They acknowledged the fact that Peter, uh, that Leo was not a successor of the Pope before him. P Leo was a successor of Peter, and Peter was still speaking through Leo today. Right. In Chapter 7, ten common attacks on the papacy. Uh, the first one up is the Pope can change doctrine. Can he? No, he cannot change doctrine, but a lot of people who don't uh, take the time to understand, that's why we wrote this book, so mm -hmm. people wouldn't have these misconceptions. He is not, he cannot change doctrine. No pope, and every pope, subsequent pope, is more restricted, in a sense, than the pope before him, because what one, in 1950, we have the pronouncement of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven. Well, now the, all future popes are bound by that. They can't change they that. They can't go back and it. say, well, we decided no, that wasn't really they true. No, they can't do that. Okay. The Holy Spirit will preserve the, the pope from doing anything like that. So we don't but, believe in like progressive revelation like by saying Mormons do. In no, that and, and the very fact of the Assumption of Mary was something that was believed way back at the beginning. A lot of times the right. Pope only, de uh, the church defines doctrine only when it's been challenged. Right. So we believe something, but then somebody centuries later challenges it and we say, well, we better define it and make it clear. Which is then. why sometimes it confuses people when they say, well, this was only defined like 15, in the year 1500, so this is kind of new rather than realizing no, it was only then that somebody actually exactly. questioned the belief. The longer it takes to define a doctrine just means that it has been accepted longer and more more universally than the others right. and it wasn't cha and when it finally is challenged mm -hmm. modernity has challenged a lot of our thing. Then we have to define it clearly. Right. But it, the later it's defined really means the longer it's been accepted. That's a good point. Uh, another accusation we hear this all the sinfulness of some popes shows that they are not infallible and you hear the names rolled out Alexander the sixth or what happened with Pope Honorius or somebody right. else like that and and if you do actually read these some of these stories like in Rod Bennett's book you know it's kind of like whoa there's a lot of bad actors yeah, out there. Yeah they are. That's the beauty of of the Holy Spirit being in charge because even though a Pope and there have been bad popes even though they lived wrong they never taught that it was okay to do that and to live right mm -hmm. to live that way and so and, and we look at peter he's the one that denied jesus so i've i've heard somebody say that jesus chose the weakest link first mm -hmm. in the chain of of the papacy peter denied jesus right that's how can you get worse than that in right. some ways but because of that he was still considered infallible because the holy spirit was superintending him and what he did Never are we promised that the Pope is going to be perfect, mm -hmm. that he's going to be smart, that he's going to say things in a timely manner or say them eloquently. Right. We are promised that he would lead the church, he would teach the church, and that the Holy Spirit would superintend. Right, and here's the other question. Paul's rebuke of St. Peter in Galatians 2 shows that Peter lacked authority in the early church and was not inf infallible. You'll go on to say, Paul isn't the only one to have corrected a Pope. When St. Catherine of Siena reproved uh, Pope Gregory the Eleventh uh, for living in Avignon instead of Rome. He returned to Rome. Catherine was later made a doctor of the church. So the question is, can someone question or challenge the Pope? Yes. I would make the caveat that recognizing the office and the position that it has, to, if there is ever a criticism of the Pope, I think it should be done by the people who are in a position to do so, mm -hmm. which would be, I think, the bishops who are brother mm -hmm. bishops with him. I'm not in a position to go out on the street and start criticizing the Pope. That's not my job. Right. I hope that those who do have that job will do their job, 
My job is to share the faith and teach it. Right. But the question came, is a pope beyond criticism? And I've had people, when I say something that I disagree with uh, something that goes on or is said, mm -hmm. people say, well, you're a schismatic. Right. You're a heretic. And I'd say that's not the case because then you have to say the same of St. Paul. Right. St. Paul was not the pope. Peter was. And it said, and publicly, Peter says, and he wrote it in Scripture, I confronted Peter to his face because yeah, Paul, he stood right. condemned. Right. Paul said to Peter. Right, exactly. And so that shows right there. And how did Peter respond to that? Peter responded well. In humility. In humility. He says, you know what, you're right. I have taught correctly, but I'm living hypocritically right. compared to what I've taught. Right. And he took what uh, Paul said, and he was humble about it, and he was right. willing to listen and correct his conduct to correspond with what he had already taught. Right, and we have to always remember uh, Paul uh, teaching the truth in love. That's when right. When we have these exactly. conversations, do this. Just before we go, any other books in the works? Yes, I'm just right now finishing a commentary on Genesis. I don't think there's anything like it in the Catholic right. world. It's about 500 pages, and it's going to be a fun read. I want it to be right. like a novel, but I'm bringing out all the historical context, the Jewish. It's just. I it's can't wait to see a 500-page fun read. Thank you so much, <laughs> You're Steve Frank. You. Always a pleasure Thank you. seeing you, along with Dennis Walters, wrote the book, The Papacy, What the Pope Does and Why It Matters by Ignatius Press, available through the EW10 Religious Catalog. EW10RC.com, check it out. Check us out next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks.